Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Weiss, and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Programs at the Jewish Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation featuring Edmund Duvall and Sandy Borarski, presented in conjunction with the exhibition, The Hair with Amber Eyes. The exhibition is on view at the Jewish Museum through May 15th, 2022, and we encourage you to visit if you are able to do so. The James L. Weinberg Distinguished Lecture is made possible by the Marshall M. Weinberg Fund with additional support from Marshall M. Weinberg, and we are thankful for their support of the museum's programming. Now I would like to briefly introduce our speakers. Edmund Duvall is an internationally acclaimed artist and author, renowned for his best-selling memoir, The Hair with Amber Eyes, as well as The White Road and Letters to Commando. He has been awarded the Costa Book Award for Biography, the Royal Society of Literature Ondaatje Prize, and the Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize for Nonfiction. His artwork has been exhibited in museums and galleries around the world. Sandy Borarski is an award-winning journalist, editor, and author. She has written several books, most recently, 212 Views of Central Park, Experiencing New York's Jewel from Every Angle. Her essays and articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Jerusalem Post, and other publications. And for many years, she served as the culture editor of the New York Jewish Week. It is my pleasure to welcome them to present this conversation. It's a huge pleasure to be with you today um, in conversation with Sandy. It's, it's, a, it's an enormous privilege uh, to be able to share a conversation with you. And, and I want to just start by um, talking about the afterlife um, of the hair with amber eyes, but I want to begin that afterlife with this picture of the passport of my great grandfather, born in Odessa, that place which we are so anxious about now in its peril, perilous moment of, of, of the life of that great city. Born in Odessa, grew up, if I can have the next slide, in this great city of Vienna. This is the family house, if I can have the next slide, an enormous great block of Vienna. And what I describe in the Hair with Amber Eyes is, is how this extraordinary treasure house, this, this great vast palace, uh, if I can have the next slide, was imperiled by this moment and the next slide of the Angelus, this moment when Austria welcomes um, with open arms um, um, the Nazi uh, invasion of, 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 of Germany becomes one with Germany. And the next slide, this moment of when, when my great-grandparents were, 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 were assaulted and beaten up, um, and my great-grandfather um, saw the whole of his family life taken apart, moment by moment by moment. And this happened. His exile, this, this, this extraordinary document which allows him to leave um, Czechoslovakia and leave um, and become a refugee. His wife, my great grandmother, commits suicide. So this is where we begin, the next slide. We begin with my great grandfather, here he is in exile, a stateless, a stateless man in Tunbridge Wells in England with my, my grandmother and my, um, and my father. And when I published the book, I think that in some ways that is really the end of the end of the story, because I don't realize at that moment when I published the book that my story is, of course, far from unique. It's, it's, it's all of our stories, this, this extraordinary parallel uh, of all these stories of exile and migration and dispersion. What do you do with that kind of knowledge? What do you do as well when you get asked by Vienna, by the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna, the, the museum that organized the systematic looting of, of all the Jewish art collections of Vienna and, and the spoilation of, of so many families of, and, and um, to do an, an exhibition, to do an event in this place. They own this beautiful temple, the Thasius Temple on the Ringstrasse. This happens a year after the hair with Amber Eyes comes out. And what I do is to choose to talk to this man. I have the next slide, Paul Celan, the great poet born in Chernovitz, now in Ukraine, born into Romanian Jewish family. He sees his family killed 
during the, the, the Shoah, he writes this beautiful, fractured, mesmeric German poetry. And so what I do, if I can have the next slide, is to make an installation for the Theseus temple using one of his poems. And the next slide, I make two huge vitrines. And the next slide, please, where I show, and the next slide, where I show in this beautiful space, these fragile porcelain objects held together like pages of a book, a poem, Lichtswang, like Jures. And I do this and the critics hate it because it's Vienna, but then I have another invitation, a more complex invitation from the Kunsthistorische Museum uh, to do an installation, an intervention. What will I do in Vienna, the city of my, of my family, the city that threw my family out? What I choose to do is to do an exhibition in almost complete darkness. I call it, I have the next slide, during the night. And I take a great uh, watercolor of Albrecht Dürer's where he sees a nightmare in the middle of the night, which is held in the museum collections. And round it, if I can have the next three slides, please, is to put all these objects about nighttime and anxiety and bring them together in this almost total darkness. Um, and I bring together broken things. If you see this slide, it's a broken crystal dragon, which was in the vaults of the, of the Kunstkammer. You see this next slide, you'll see the brokenness um, and, and the emptiness of these things. I put together an exhibition about anxiety, about anxiety in the middle of Vienna. And I make one huge new installation. Here it is called During the Night and it's black vessels, and it's gunpowder, it's, it's, and toxic things and bits of lead. It's, it's an installation about fracture, about not being able to bring things back together again. And that's really the last 10 years of my life. How do you deal with trauma? Well, what it does is take you back to the places where the trauma begins. And that, if you see the next three slides, please, takes me back to Paris, to the place where my family began on the Rue de Monceau. And it takes me to this extraordinary place, the Musée Camondeau, if I can have the next four or five slides, this amazing house of Petit Trianon full of French treasures, full of French furniture, uh, full of great things. And upstairs in this extraordinary house, there are archives. Next slide. High up in this Jewish family house, Camondeau family came from Constantinople exactly the same time my family came from Odessa. And they created this amazing place and filled it with French treasures and made a great museum. Here it is. Here's the catalogue, the Musée Nissim de Camondo. Here's the, here's the catalogue that was, that was published on the day that the whole house was handed over to France in gratitude for what France had given the Camondo family, these cousins of mine. But yet again, there is fracture. 1940 the pillaging of the Jewish families of Paris. And this picture and the next picture show you the horrors of the taking away of their possessions, but then more painfully and more exactingly in the archives are these documents which show how Louise and her, cousin, her, her, her husband and their two children are taken away from their family house and taken into the concentration camp of Drancy on the outskirts of Paris, and then deported to Auschwitz. So going back into the archives, when you see this photograph of the young boy, uh, Tron Reinach, cousin of my grandmother's, who's uh, murdered in Auschwitz, you are having to deal with this issue of what presence memory still has, what, what agency memory still has for us. Because here in this extraordinary mansion are still the empty rooms, untouched, since the family gave the, the great mansion to France, but then were taken away. From it. So I write letters. I write letters to the Camondo family. I write to them about belonging and about memory and about responsibility, how you hold a story together. And then I make work and put it back into the museum. Um, Nothing's been touched in this place, but here throughout the house, in all these different spaces, I make porcelain vessels and hold them in vitrines. 
here, this, this beautiful French Sèvres desk, I open the drawers and put broken pieces of porcelain inside the drawers. And on the desks, if we see the next couple of slides, where Moise de Camondeau, the great patriarch, wrote the letters, I, I put porcelain letters back on the desks. What I'm trying to do is to re-inhabit the house, bring the family back. And in some cases, it's obvious I put installations on desks. But then if you see these other slides, I find the hidden spaces, the drawers, which are now empty and put the letters back in. Or finally here, up in the cupboards of the attics, I open the cupboards up and put vessels back. I'm trying to re-inhabit, re-speak uh, to the revenant possibilities of a place, the, the, the coming back uh, to, 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 to life of something which is fragile and broken and maybe even forgotten. And outside the house, I put these great benches that I make, places for people to sit and, 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 and spend time. And if you look at the benches, the next couple of slides, beautiful stone, just on the edges of the benches, this final slide, is there a piece of gold? Can you see that, the golden lead? It's a kind of kintsugi, a kind of marking of fracture. And finally, what do you do with all this knowledge? You try and make something positive happen, which is why I did this great project, the Library of Exile. I made a library, and if you see the next slide of it, on the edges of the library, I wrote a history of all the destroyed and burnt books in the world, the, the places where holy people and, and people in power have tried to destroy them. And on this great corner of the library, I wrote the lines, where they will burn books, then they will burn humans, Heinrich Heine's prophetic words. But inside, inside this library are four installations called Psalm. Each of the Psalms, the Psalms as we know are the songs of exile, porcelain and marble. And one of these installations I'm very, very proud of saying this one here is going to the new National Library of Israel in Jerusalem in, in the autumn. But then you'll see books, lots and lots of books, because it had 2,000 books written by all, all kinds of exiled libraries, uh, writers, people forced into exile, dozens of languages. And during the two years of the tour of the Library of Exile, people wrote their names. If you keep going and look at these slides, I love these pictures. Um, you'll see that there were ex libris plates, people suggested books. And finally, this picture, um, people wrote their names if a book mattered to them. Uh, this is in the uh, a marvelous book, The Tiger That Came to Tear, children's book written by a wonderful German refugee writer, Jewish writer called Judith Kerr. Um, and hundreds and hundreds of people wrote their names in this book. And now that whole library, that whole library is in Mosul in Iraq, where the Great Library was destroyed um, uh, by ISIS, and they've been rebuilding it. Now that Great Library, a Library of Migration, has ended up there. And what do you do? What do you do with all this stuff? Well, you hand it over. So here I am with my dad and the two wonderful people from the Jewish Museum in Vienna, and we gave our whole family archive to the Jewish Museum in Vienna. And they did an extraordinary job and made a beautiful exhibition. And the point of the exhibition was it brought my dad back to Vienna. And here he is with a portrait of himself in the exhibition and movingly. Um, he gave a speech, the next slide, in his old family house uh, in the Palais of Frissi. And here he is being greeted by the president of Austria who announced that, that um, Holocaust era families could reclaim their citizenship. And my father has now reclaimed 82 years late, he's now 93, his own Austrian citizenship. So what do you do? It brings you to think about how you can animate history. And that takes us to this last few slides, <laughs> this wonderful, extraordinary exhibition. And if you can roll through these slides, what you can see is how the Jewish Museum in New York have reanimated this collection of objects that mattered so much to my family um, and have brought the book that I wrote about trying to understand what that family did and where they were uh, to life in this sort of mesmeric way. 
It incorporates all kinds of things, including amazingly um, 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 a, a picture which has only just been restituted to it. If I have this next slide, this picture has only just been restituted to us from an Austrian museum. It's an ongoing process, but that ongoing momentum of trying to understand how we deal with our history takes me to the next slide and the next slide, the, the vitrine of our Netscape, um, this wonderful collection of objects. But then finally, when you see these objects, you'll realize that not all of them are there because the very final slide after this one shows you a wall. And this wall is all the objects in the collection that we sold uh, for a refugee council here in Britain to, set, to, 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 to give money back um, to the refugee community. Because you can hold on to a family story and you can hope that you can shape it, but actually it's, as soon as you've put it out in the world, you are in a complex, powerful, and fissile environment where things changed. And as a family, we wanted to honor the fact that as a, we are still a refugee family and we wanted to talk to other refugee families out there in the world. And, and for me, that's almost the most significant part of the whole exhibition, which is that you can write a book, but what happens next is what matters most. Thank you. That's my 12 minutes on the afterlife. Thanks so much, Edmund, for that really wonderful, excellent um, presentation. It's really great to see that line through your work in these last years. Um, and it's, it's just a pleasure to be here with you. you I'm a long well. time admirer of your work. I love the ways that you integrate so many things that I and so many others care deeply about history cultural memory, art, identity, the meaning of home, and of course, stories. Stories. And you're such a beautiful stylist, whether you're <laughs> writing or creating objects. Um, just thinking about those last slides of the Jewish Museum, I know you were very involved in the um, creation and conception of the show, but what is it like for you um, walking through those rooms that bring together these you know, generations of your family and these beautiful objects. Um, it's in, actually, Sandy, it's incredibly moving. You know, it's incredibly moving. I hadn't quite expected to be taken apart as much as I was by it. But of course, those rooms are full of people I know and love, you know, and I've spent a huge amount of my life sort of walking in their footsteps and it might be, Charles if we see in Paris, or it might be my great grandfather, or, or it might be the people I knew and, and loved more intimately, my grandmother and my, and my great uncle Iggy and, and Giro. So what I'm seeing in those rooms, of course, is, is the sort of, is, is, is their life. I mean, in a granular way. I mean, you know, the things they saw, the things they handled and cared about, or, or, or very kind of, sort of searingly the documents which record, you know, the taking a part of their lives, you know, trying to leave Austria or crossing a border or the documents which sort of dispossess them. So it, it, it's, it's very, it's kind of beautiful and painful really, to be honest, Sunday. it really is. Um, one of the pleasures, I mean, one feels all that mix mm. of emotions that, um, walking through the show, but one of the pleasures is, is one puts on the earphones and hears your voice narrating and the really beautiful writing. So I thought it would be great to give listeners just a sense of how beautiful your sentences are on the page. And I, I could have chosen any number of um, places, but I thought since this is so much about objects, maybe to kind of explain your connection to objects, I'm looking at um, that section in the prologue that we, um, page 16. Okay, that's my prompt, isn't it, Sandy? Let me read, <laughs> okay. Let me read, let me read. All this matters. Actually, can I begin the paragraph before? Just please, melancholy, please. can I begin with the word or melancholy? To, or go back maybe to, sure. Um, actually, do you know what I'm gonna do? Can, can I begin with nostalgia? 
Great. I'm going to begin with melancholy. I'm going to begin with melancholy. Always begin with melancholy. Perhaps that tells you more about me than you, than you need to know. Melancholy, I think, is a sort of default vagueness, a get out clause, a smad smothering lack of focus. And this net scale is a small, tough explosion of exactitude. It deserves this kind of exactitude in return. All this matters because my job is to make things. How objects get handled, used and handed on is not just a mildly interesting question for me, it is my question. I've made many, many thousands of pots. I'm very bad at names, I mumble and fudge, but I'm good on pots. I can remember the weight and the balance of a pot and how its surface works with its volume. I can read how an edge releases tension or creates it. I can feel if it has been made at speed or with diligence, if it has warmth. I can see how it works with the objects that sit nearby, how it displaces a small part of the world around it. And I can also remember if something invited touch with a whole hand or just the fingers or with an object that asked you to stay away. Is that enough? Um, sure. <laughs> I, keep going, I keep going. Actually, it's not bad, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, just I've like read this for ages. <laughs> this, um, actually, this, this whole section goes on onto the kind of complication of my dad giving me a supermarket bag full of the family archive, a super carrier bag, and saying, now you're, now you're the carrier, now you have the family archive, and me kind of going, you know, oh, help. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've forgotten that bit. Um, thank you. Uh, really beautiful. Um, so I thought it's irresistible to talk about the Nitsky yeah. and, um, and they have this prominent place um, in the exhibition. Mm. They're so tactile that one, um, you know, would like to kind of touch it. Maybe you can explain what it feels like, but I realized maybe we should just go back a little bit for those who haven't read the book and sort of explain how it is that you came to, um, own this collection, which then becomes kind of the spine of the book and the spine of the exhibition. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a story about um, inheritance. It's an it's inheritance that I received from uh, my very beloved great uncle, Iggy Efrasi, Jewish gentleman in, in, in Tokyo. Um, and he had inherited it in a complicated way. So the whole collection had actually begun in Paris um, in the 1870s, um, collected by a, a cousin of my grandfather's. Um, he was a great art collector, Charles Frissy. He was a friend of the Impressionists and a friend of Proust and had a great circle of, a circle of, of remarkable friends. And, and he bought this collection um, in his Belle Epoque period and then handed them on as a gift to my great grandfather, Victor, who was living in Vienna when he got married. So then it moves from Paris to Vienna and survives this tumultuous, tumultuous period of time in, in, in ex the extraordinary life of, 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 of Jewish Vienna. Survives the war in a very peculiar and, and painful way when everything else is, is, is taken away and given back to my grandmother, Elizabeth, who then hands it on to my great uncle, Iggy, who takes it to Japan and then I inherit it and bring it back to London. So it's Japan to Paris, to Vienna, to, to England, to Japan, to England, five generations, five generations of a family. And so the story of, of, of them is really a kind of story really about, we use the word belonging and home. It's a story about home, where, you know, where do objects belong and how do you tell the story of, of them and, and, and who handles them and who loves them. What stories go with them, I suppose. Do you know much about the people who made them? Do we know like how they yeah. were created? And, uh... Yes, and it's, and it's fantastic because, because I'm a maker. I got very obsessed by, 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 by the art of their car that goes into their carving and so many of them are signed. And so, you know, you find that there's a particular carver who only carves rats. 
you know, <laughs> or, you know, a particular carver who's very well known for, for, for a particular tiger that he adored carving or, uh, you know, and so you, you begin to get the feeling of people who are have, with enormous tenderness and, and, and diligence, but tenderness at the heart of it, um, um, created these small sculptures. Um, you know, and some of them are absolutely the best that you could ever find. And some of them are rubbish. I mean, some of them are really not very good. <laughs> but, but so, you know, you have a collection, which is a, in some ways, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a short story collection or a collection of poets. It's, it's, it's a lot of discrete objects, which when they come together, uh, you know, make a, a fantastic hole that you can, uh, uh, that you can sink into. Uh, and that's, that's the bit, Sandy, where you can just absolutely see people in Paris after some incredible, incredible kind of literary dinner, handing them around, mm -hmm. or you can absolutely see my grandmother, you know, in, in the, her mother's dressing room in 1904, playing with them on the floor. You know, you absolutely can see that. It, they work. They really work. No, you say that it was on your only on your like third trip to Vienna yeah. that you sort of finally took in or had this greater sense of the meaning of this collection. What happened then, and what did you sense? I think. I, I mean, Vienna is a hugely difficult city. From I mean, you know, so you know. So, in, in some ways, you, you know, the, the writing of the book was a series of, um, of, of, in some ways, sort of crossing, crossing really complicated emotional hurdles, you know, um, and, you know, the, the beginning of the book, you know, am I really going to commit to, to, to discovering what happened? You know, it's one thing, and, researching in Paris was a joy, you know, because it is, but, 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 but somehow the Vienna story, you know, the, the, the trying to understand the, the, the presence of, 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 I suppose, the, the disappearance of my family from that city was enormously difficult. Um, it, partly because there I was and I was researching and, and there was the huge family house. I mean, it's, you can't bloody miss it. But everyone was saying, no, we know nothing about the family, you know, and it's a whole block of Vienna, you know, but there was no sense of them being there. And so, you know, and trying to get into the house and them saying, you know, no entry and all that kind of stuff. So the whole, the whole beginning of that attempt to understand Vienna was really, in, was really painful. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm getting trauma coming back. Um, yes, um, and thank you. When you talk about the Niski, I also just have this, I always think of Iggy. Yeah. Um, and he's such a delightful character to meet your uncle who's in Japan, who finally is the one who gives you the mm. collection. That, and there's a certain joyousness to him um, and a kind of resilience, I think. Mm. And it's so moving that all that your family has gone through, that there's this resilience, and I think you have it too. And how do you under, I wonder how you um, understand that and explain that strength? Well, I, I'm not sure about myself. I mean, it's, it's, a, but it's, a, it's a very, very profound thing, which is um, I, I've recently been talking, working with other second and third generation families. Um, and there are so many interesting things there, Sandy, to unpack. One is that that initial generation of Holocaust survivors um, or Holocaust era families, um, often their resilience, often they did have enormous resilience. Um, I think of my grandmother, who never dreamt of complaining or, or, or mentioning that her material circumstances were different from the ones that she grew up in. And Iggy similarly, I mean, Iggy talked so positively about the joy of being in Japan, you know, the, the fact that he'd found this particular wonderful man to spend his life with, Japanese culture, um, 
you know, and, and talked about the, the Netscape collection as being the thing that brought him home. I mean, you know, remarkable, he used the word home. So resilience, absolutely, in that generation. Um, and then asylum, and they talked about what happened, actually, to me. Uh, my father's generation, it's 1993, almost total silence. So, you know, um, um, my father's generation, a generation that, um, that became more English than the English, you know, even though he has a strong Austrian accent, I have to say. <laughs> um, um, and, then, and then my generation, which is trying to unpack the levels of what they're told and the levels of silence, um, and, and trying to navigate this, this, strange, this strange space, really, Sandy, of, 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 of identity, you know, where, where, do, where do we actually belong? I mean, where, you know, um, I end my next, my last book on saying that I'm a, you know, I'm a mongrel. I'm, I'm, I'm just a bit of this and a bit of that, and, and a, you know, half this and a quarter that, and, um, 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 and and so there's that sort of. So I, I, I would never talk about resilience <laughs> in relation to, to myself, yeah. but I absolutely pin that absolutely on, on that generation, that older generation. I guess to me, your creativity is, is a sign of resilience and that you've taken the silence and memory and all of these themes that come out of it and, and have managed to create really important and beautiful works. Well, I, I, you know what, I'm angry. You know, I'm, I, I want to make beautiful work and I'm angry. So, you know, those two things are very, um, uh, they, they're both in the same force field for me, uh, um, which is that um, there's a lot of unresolved things out there. Uh, um, um, there's a lot of um, things that I, I talk about in The Hair with Amber Eyes, which are about, um, uh, um, about effacement and erasure, about people facing history and erasing it, and and um, failing to look at it um, with with honesty in the face. And and um, and there are moments in the book where I'm really taken apart by by what I find, you know. Um, and 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 so, you know, what what I try and do, and I, that's why I gave you those examples of those exhibitions in Vienna, is to try and make something which is authentic and beautiful, really beautiful, um, but actually does look unflinchingly at, um, at what happened um, and what still is unresolved um, um, in Austria. Um, and in some ways, you know the the library of exile that I created is a is a, is I hope a kind of affirmation against a backdrop of, of really horrible things in the world of affirmation of how we should value and nurture um, exiles and refugees. You know, all these books behind me are written by people who cross borders for God's sake. You know, so. It's, it's these two things. And, and when I make, I, when I'm making pots, I'm making, I hope something which is beautiful um, and has, but is, but there's fragility there. So all these things are, are, are mixed up together. That was a very long answer to your question. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that seems to underlie all of this is, is memory. And mm. I wonder if for you, memory is an anchor. An anchor sounds quite um, um, it's, it's, it, there's more it, it's it's more an unfolding for me, I think. Um, um, there's a beautiful um, there's a beautiful and complicated writer called Jean Amery, who was one of the great Austrian writers who wrote in French and German. Um, and he's a, a survivor of Auschwitz and, and, and a, a great philosopher. And he, he writes about memory. He says that 
the important thing about memory is that it's not it's not a, fi a fixed place. It's it's an activity, um, and that we that the responsibility is is that it is to continually remember. It's, it's this state of 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 uncovering and and and, and of possibility. And that feels to me such a truth, Sandy, that actually, you know, we, all this stuff that we talk about and care about is, it's not finding a kind of a sort of singular thing to remember. It's, it's, it, it's, it's a, it changes us. It's an, it's a, it's an active, an active part of our life. And, and, and for me, you know writing these books or going back to these places or making exhibitions is a an act of remembering remembering and then i think and then it really shapes you know the way you view the present and and the future and kind of dictates perhaps the way that we'll act i hope um, so. yes and i um so i mean what 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 one of the things i'm very sort of moved by i think is in this current exhibition at the Jewish Museum, um, is is not that I'm going to listen to it myself, but the idea that you're listening to my words as you go around. So, in some That's sense, right. you, you 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 know you are in motion <laughs> through the exhibition. It's not a series of. It's not. I suppose it's the heart of it. It's not didactic. You know, it's not me going. This this thing matters. This thing matters. This thing matters. This and learn stuff. It's, it's it's really about uncovering um, and exploring, and and I guess that's that's what the that's what these books are also <laughs> about, you know, that activity. So I, I wanted to move on a little bit to the. Mm -hmm. I love the letters to Commando, okay. and um, mm -hmm. so here you are in the middle of lockdown, you know, yeah. imagining that you're <laughs> in this beautiful um, yeah. 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 home in in Paris. Um, but you write that book is written with with a very different voice. Yes. And um, so maybe um, it would be great to just let's read a, a piece from that um, yeah. where you're describing some of the beautiful objects in the in the house. And I, I'm looking at um, page fifty. Oh, now which letter is that? Because I think we've got different. Um, at nineteen. Nineteen. Um, yeah. Roman numeral 19 with that beautiful desk um, that you showed us. There we go. So, so this is me writing, writing to Moise de Camondo, the, this great collector, this great monsieur. Who was a relative of your family, kind of. Yeah, the families yeah. were connected, the yeah, yeah. commandos and the Afrusis. Yeah, they were, everyone's a cousin. <laughs> Basically. Um, um, so, um, I, I call him lots of different things, but here I'm calling him Monsieur. Monsieur, I cannot help but notice that you like furniture that changes. In the small study is a mechanical table made by Roger van der Cruz à la Bourgogne in oak and walnut, veneered with bloodwood and aberrant, and tulip wood and holly and chased in gilt bronze. You press a button, and a section rises sighingly. You press this panel and a drawer exhales. These are surfaces to be caressed and let go, pressed and released, drawers for secrets, a desk for the life you keep close, you open to a vacancy. And here is a table attributed to David Röntgen that hinges up so you can stand and be important, maps of campaigns, plans, for the new wing. It all works perfectly. Your house is a place where everything is something else. It's a baroque riposte against truth to materials. Here, one material segues into another. Your hand touches gold on the arms of the chair on which you sit. There are plaques of porcelain set into the furniture. This is an interior as performance in which you two are a protagonist catching sight of yourself in the mirrors. Everything is multiple, mirrored, paired, reflected, repeated. I really do like him and I really love, and I just the final, sorry, this is the final paragraph, this is really good. 
This house is like a complex mechanical box. Push this door gently. There are spaces here, silences, one thing becoming another, one person becoming another. Doors to slip through, slip away. And, and, and the reason, the reason that all that matters is of course that this is a, you know, an orthodox Jewish merchant from Constantinople whose family has come to Paris and he's become, he's become, he's changed himself. He's become the perfect Parisian gentleman. So I, I'm going around and I'm, I'm sort of tuning in to assimilation, to this moment of, of, of how he becomes French. And, and he, there's so much, I guess it's just beautiful stuff in that house. And he, it seems like his instinct is to never throw anything out from <laughs> lists and things. Can you understand that, that instinct? Painfully, and, yes. I mean, you know, he, he, he really does keep absolutely everything. And, and so, um, so the house is this sort of extraordinarily beautiful installation of perfect stuff. And, uh, but then, you know, the, 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 the archives and the attics are absolutely packed with, with everything you can possibly imagine from sort of menus um, um, that for his great dinners and sort of orders for, for, the, for, the, for the food and the wine or descriptions of how he wants the, you know, the bedding in, in the garden next to the park and also you know, the colours changed year by year. Or, or every single object he buys. And, and do I understand the obsessional compulsion to collect <laughs> stuff? Um, uh, you know, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> well, yes. My dog has just come to say hello. Actually, I write to um. She's just come to say hello to me. And actually, one of my letters to to Moise de Camondo is all about dogs. About yep. she's a French gun dog, and so I, I write to him that. The Georgian and the French gun dogs is my dog under my table here. Um, so yes, do I understand the compulsion to collect? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, and I think it, it's so much part of his desire to assimilate, but in the end, ultimately, it doesn't work. Um, well, this is, this is, this is the, this is the, this is the, the, you know, I keep talking about fracture. This is the moment of fracture, which is that, you know, he, in some ways he believes, just like my great-grandfather, exactly, exactly the same age, my great-grandfather believed that that great house in Vienna, full of everything, you know, and being a member of every club and giving generously to, to every charity and, and, and Moise de Camondo in Paris, exactly the same thing, giving this great collection to France. But that, that, that handing over of a gift was a, would, would protect them, that would, it, it, it would show just how perfectly attuned they were um, to the society in which they had chosen to become. Um, and in both cases, Moise de Camondo's family, most tragically, um, you know, there, there is this fracture that, you know, it, it does nothing. The, the, the house is given in 1936, and the family are deported in 1942. I mean, you know, I mean, that's, you know, you know trying to understand that is really hard. You know, you, and, but I have such profound, people kept, people have always said to me, you know, why didn't your grandfather, great grandfather, why didn't your grandmother leave earlier? Why, why did they stay? And, you know, people don't believe that their home is going to be taken away from them, that their neighbours are going to turn on. You know, people, um, why should they believe it? You know, why should you believe that your children who have gone to the same school, you know, are, are going to be, all that horror is going to happen? Mm -hmm. You have such empathy and it, it comes across in, um... <laughs> In your writing and you're, you're speaking so much so powerfully i wonder it, writing these jewish stories um mm. and immersing yourself in this world for so long how mm. that has affected your own you know jewish identity your connection to jewishness oh, profoundly i mean you know i 
you know, as, as, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit Jewish. <sighs> you know, I'm not 100% Jewish at all. But the, but the identification, um, um, the identification um, and understanding of um, who I am and where I am in the world is 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 very very profoundly affected by having walked in these particular footsteps over the last 20 years 20 30 years um how could i not be affected and and in some ways the you know the 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 fact that that the the, the work that i make the books that I write, but also the, the work that I make with my hands, very much talks to 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 that um, identity. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm here next to a huge installation by um, I made on, on the work of Paul Celan. Um, um, there it is. It's a huge vitrine. Uh, it's a poem. Um, um, it's a, that's a poem by Paul, Sil Paul Silan called A Place Made Fast. Um, he, you know, so these things, these things are, are, are one for me, um, the writing and the making. And they do come back ultimately to, um, to, a very, to a very deep faith actually. Thing is that I, I grew up in this complicated way is I grew up in the Church of England. Uh, my father, though Jewish, was became Christian and became the Dean of Canterbury. And so I grew up completely saturated in, in the Episcopalian, to put it in an American um, way, um, church, but grew up in, in, a, in a great cathedral, one of the great cathedrals, listening all the time to, to that music. And of course, you know, one of the things that, that, that saturated my childhood was the Psalms, you know, and for me, the Psalms have been this hugely powerful way of connecting these two, these two parts of my upbringing into one, really, because they're the shared, the shared kind of moment. Um, they're, you know, because it's poetry, because they're songs of exile, because they're, they're ridiculously beautiful and complex. And so, Everything comes back to me towards the Psalms, actually, I think. Um, and I, I think, again, of your Uncle Iggy and this powerful moment when when Iggy dies and is buried and there you are saying the Kaddish um, as, as your father, you know, yeah. Yeah. said for his mother. Yeah. Um, in yes. Yeah. I mean, it's very, you know, and that was, that was, I mean, that makes, that was so straightforward for me you know there I was in this beautiful beautiful um Buddhist temple in Tokyo with Jiro next to my my uncle Jiro next to next to me and we'd done all the Buddhist rites and you know and the abbot of the temple you know looks to me to say what I need to say and it just seems so incredibly appropriate to say that for him so yeah something's just something's just you know are right are right mm -hmm. and are there other like jewish traditions that have um become meaningful to you i imagine you probably get more um invitations to pass over satyrs than uh, <laughs> than anyone else these days <laughs> i mean I, I i i over this i then draw a veil except to say um that um i was very profoundly moved, profoundly moved by the fact that two years ago um, in uh, joined the Venice Biennale, I, I was invited to, to put work into the extraordinary Canton Scuola, the amazing synagogue in the ghetto in, 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 um, in Venice. Um, and I made a piece called Sukkah for the, for, for the Sukkah. Um, and that, that installation has, um, started there up, up high in the sukkah in the, in the ghetto, and then uh, for almost a year it was in Canterbury Cathedral. 
and now it's going off to Jerusalem. And, and, and maybe as a sort of middle-aged, conflicted writer artist, that tells you more about, about my faith than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I want to make sure we have time to talk about, I'm so interested in your interest in shards. Ah, yes. And, I, um, I have shards next to me. Can I just grab three shards? <laughs> Please do. There you go, as, as if by magic. <laughs> and these shards are of your own work, or I know you've also have Others that there are plenty of shards of my work <laughs> around. Not, no, these actually these are these are shards of of um, Sun Dynasty porcelain um, collected on a hillside in China, um, in my search for my search for porcelain. But I have shards everywhere. I have shards of of Mycen porcelain. Um, um, very moving stories um, attached to those. Um, what draws you to these? You know elements of brokenness okay. so, it seems to connect back okay. to the story in so many yeah, ways it is. i mean so okay so you know you pick up a shard i want to hand this to this, towards you in the screen <laughs> i sort of can't believe i can't hand this straight across to you so what and what you've got there of course is a, is absolutely you've got a story you know as soon as you've got something which is broken fragment like that um you've you've you've, you've got um you've got a profound an extraordinary thing. So to start, it's painful. You know, there's nothing easy about a shard. I mean, these are incredibly sharp. Um, and you think about Job, if I can be a little Jewish for a moment, sitting on his pile of, of broken pot shards, you know, and that's the book of Job is predicated on, on a man sitting on broken, broken pottery. Um, but the reason they matter is, of course, not only does it say that all objects all objects are going to break. You know that, that there's you cannot invest in wholeness in the unbroken object um, because because you know um, the the velocity of the world, the velocity of history, will always make something break. So you have to deal with that. You have to understand what it is to find a broken thing, whether it's an object or a story. Or, or a family, or a country, or a, you know, you have to deal with fracture. Um, and then, of course, you have the the, the issue of, of what do you do with the shard? Do you, do you try and rebuild the object around it seamlessly, or, or, or are you involved in some in some way with kintsugi? This idea of mending with mending the Japanese technique of mending a, a broken object so that you can see the fault lines, you can see the losses. Um, so, so, so shards, shards and stories are, are, are absolutely like this. There's a book in it, I promise you, there's a really good book in it. So yeah, in your, the exhibition at the Frick, yeah. um, you had these, you know, sort of beautiful sculptural yeah. objects and inside of these kind of perfect porcelain vessels, were shards, yes, and that that seemed like a beautiful connection of brokenness and wholeness and beauty. There's a, a wonderful quote from Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Kutz that there's nothing more whole than a broken heart. Um, well, you, you, good on that, Rabbi. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it's it, it's so interesting, isn't it? Um, and I think that I I think. Um, it's very, very interesting. It's very interesting handing a shard, um, handing a shard on to someone else. Actually, it, it sounds like a sort of complicated thing to do, but it, it absolutely isn't. It's emotionally, people very are very connected, intuitively, to handling something, um, or which has already been broken. Um, the, the, there seems to be a sort of um, 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 I suppose there's some tenderness about how you about how you hold something. You don't hold it with anxiety. You hold it with knowledge. It's almost like you know that you you know what a broken thing might might mean, um, and that's very very something very extraordinary there. Something I don't I haven't I haven't all worked it out at all, but I will. 
well, sure, it's also um, big me to think about dust, mm. which is something else that you write about and have images of you sweeping dust yeah. as a young man, as a potter. And then um, in the commando house, he's, you know, very much against dust, but you say something beautiful about, you know, in dust, we, you know, we see the traces and that seems so important. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, you know, the, 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 I, I, I have a, I've, I have a lot of time for dust. I mean, and uh, it's, 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 um, and I think you know, Moise de Camondo's anxiety about dust, it's, it's trying to say, I want everything to be preserved forever, you know, seamlessly, and, and of course you can't do that. But it's in, it's in the dust that you, you, you find. That you, you that things become clearer. You you you, you discover just um, you discover what's happened. Um, uh, um, you know you d discover the, the 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 process. You d you discover the temporal. You discover time. Um, it, it's also um, you know it's it's part, I suppose it's also part of my kind of compulsion. To be in archives, you know, to get my hands dirty, you know, to pick every book up, to find each piece of paper, to pick up every every object, to kind of to try and sort of feel the weight and the weight of, of of all those different objects, because of course that's when you can. That's how you discover witness. That's how you discover. Where, where history really, truly comes alive. So is this the objects themselves are really witnesses to um, history and to family yeah, I, history? I'm, 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 I'm really unsentimental about this. And I, you know, people have been quite angry with me about this. And, but I, for me, it's, for me, it's a, for me, that's, that's kind of, that's very much, the heart of what I, what I think and feel, actually. Um, um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty implacable about that bit. Um, in um, writing and in creating, um, how do you know, like, when you're done? Like, how do you know that a piece is finished? And I imagine in some ways these stories, they don't end, but at some place you yeah. end, <laughs> you're part of the telling. Well, I mean, W.H. Auden said, you know, poem is never finished, it's only abandoned. And, you know, it's a good line. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, oh, it's, it's so difficult. It gets no easier. You know, you're a writer, you know this. It doesn't get any easier understanding about finishing finishing and, and handing things over. Um, I mean, the, 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 um, very occasionally something goes right. <laughs> you know, very occasionally, you know, you write something and it really, it just, it just lifts up into the air, you know, it just has its own kind of, extraordinary um, 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 life. And very occasionally, that's the same with something I make. But qu quite often there's, you know, there's this, there's this anxiety, this, this iterative thing, you know, coming back again and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Um, until I have to keep the phone off the hook to keep my, my editor away or the gallery you know, with a truck outside the door. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to, it's difficult to know. In the same way that I think your writing sort of calls to be read out loud, because it's so beautiful. I mean, do these pots that you make have sound? Is there oh, a... Absolutely, they do. They absolutely do. And so, I mean, some, sometimes what's lovely, of course, is that anything with a volume, just, you know, like when we were children on the beach, and you put the shell up to your, up to your ear, and you hear, you hear that emptiness as well there's that beautiful sound of, of emptiness which you get from a vessel um, and then of course with porcelain if you if you ping it you know and it rings clear that's just stunning um, you can do it with a very 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 beautiful old bowl 
It's quite extraordinary. So yes, I mean, there's, there's all that, there's absolute sounds, but then there's a sort of slightly odd thing, which is that when I see my vessels together, I kind of hear them as well. So, you know, I'm waving my arm, but this, this big installation over there, um, for me, that's a, you know, that is a soundscape as well. That's already, a, you know, sounding for me, mm -hmm. like a poem or like a piece of John Cage music. Mm -hmm. Um, that's that's a beautiful, really beautiful piece that, that you pointed out before. Do the titles, um, do you struggle with titles of works? Um, well, they are absolutely. And I, I sometimes, sometimes, my God, sometimes they come clear and sometimes in, and, they're, and they just work and work and work and work. And sometimes, sometimes I, I it takes forever. I very occasionally it comes the other way around that I, I, I wake up in the middle of the night and think, you know, um, the world of clear water, and it's Boy Stephen. That's you know, that's the, that's what I have to make next, or you know, nostos, which means homecoming. You know, the, there's something, a word or a phrase comes in, or I'm listening to a piece of music, and you know, and uh, um, and so it, it 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 draws me into into making that mm -hmm. way. Um, it, it happens all kinds of ways. It I love this word breath breath turn. Oh, one of your pieces that's yeah. also pulled from yeah. Paul Salah, yeah. which you now yeah. think about all the time. <laughs> well, rightly, isn't the most astonishingly beautiful, this beautiful idea that there's this moment of poetry between two breaths. I mean, it's just breathtakingly <laughs> beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm, glad that, I'm glad that works for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wonder about some of the new new things that you're working on. You, you mentioned to me that you're doing a library for cancer patients, which was sounds like a really important oh, yeah. project. So there's a wonderful um, um, charity in the UK called Maggot Centres um, that has these very beautiful spaces for, for those people who are living with cancer and, um, and going through treatment and they need a place of, of respite. And it occurred to me when I was going into these various reasons that they were always full of newspapers, which is Okay. But actually, so I, so I made a, a poetry library for one. Um, and now that seems to be um, um, taking off. And so I'm going to be doing poetry libraries, I hope, for all of them across mm -hmm. the UK. But, you know, I mean, I basically, you know, I'll make a library at the drop of a hat, you know, <laughs> give, give me an opportunity to make a library. Um, on one last thing about your grandfather, your great grandfather's yeah. library, mm -hmm. and this notion that he carried the key. To those yeah. locked bookcases with him when he left is that key something that you have um i don't have i don't have that key um i don't have that key but i i've been thinking of him so and i that and my father has of course who i'm seeing tonight actually and so much at the moment because of because of because of um, odessa and i was thinking because i have his um, like any good person from Odessa, uh, he any good indeed person from the old days from the Russian Empire, which is where Ukraine was, he used to drink tea in a glass with a silver handle, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I have that glass. Wow. I drink tea from it. My father remembers in the war seeing his great grandfather his grandfather, Victor, um, carefully pour the whole of their week's sugar ration <laughs> into his black tea and drink it unknowingly. This mm -hmm. old man drinking his tea by the fire. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about him. And I, I ha might have to make tea in that glass again tonight. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you um, so much, Edmund. Really wonderful to talk with you, but I so appreciate your generosity and your candor and just the po poetry of your vision um, and your big heart. Sunday. So you inspired us to all maybe think about our own family stories um, in different ways and to think about what's going on in the world um, in different ways and good health, strong hands, um, and continued really great energy. 
Um, Thank you. I, I absolutely too. loved it. I, I sort of want to hand the shard over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, honestly, thank you. I, I've absolutely loved it. You're a marvellous interlocutor. I really, really, really love this hour. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.